God, praise God. Let's try that again. Will you stand to your feet and give the King of Kings a hand of praise? Thank you, gentlemen. You may be seated. But we want to 
remind the church that the world is celebrating women, but the church must always celebrate women, not just on one day, but at all times. Because the more, the closer we get to the end time, the closer we get to the return of Christ, what we see happening is that men are getting skiers in the church. And it's falling upon our women now to carry on the work of the church. And so we celebrate the God who have called women and have used women to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And before I get into the word today, I have to share this because it's been a, a burden, Bishop. The Lord laid on my heart that there's a need for what I would call spiritual midwives. I, I stumbled upon this because God was saying it and I didn't think or I didn't pay attention at first, but he kept impressing it because as I was looking for a theme or something to guide the church as we celebrate Women History Month of March, I was drawn to the fact that I wanted to highlight and recognize uh, a very special role that women play. And I came upon the, the, the profession of a midwife. Yeah. I, I don't know if any one of you here ever met a midwife yeah. or ever needed the service of a midwife. Yeah. But the midwife, as I come to understand, is one of those ubiquitous uh, special professions. I'm sorry, let me stop using big words. I, I, it simply means that it's one of those professions that no matter what culture you go into, what country you go, yeah. how remote that place is, there's always going to be a midwife. Amen? Amen? And I celebrate that profession in this Women History Month because when a woman needs help the most, as a new mother, before and after giving birth, it is the midwife in that remote village, that place where there's no doctor or hospital. It is the midwife who must provide a holistic life-giving service. Because she doesn't only give the professional service or the technical aspect of it, but she must also provide moral and spiritual support yeah. before and after birth. Yeah. Yeah. And I celebrate that because many of our people would not have been birthed successfully yeah. if it had not been for the help or the service of a midwife. Yeah. I bless God for midwives. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But then, what God was saying the whole while I was thinking that way was the church needs spiritual midwives. Hear me, church. Mm -hmm. What the Lord impressed on my heart is that there are many of you, and I say this wherever I go now, because it's a, it's a, it's a word, it's a revelation that I got from God, and he said this is for the church. There are many of you who are who have been impregnated with a spiritual seed. It comes forth as an idea, a dream, an aspiration, something that many of you have carried for years and you don't have the boldness or the courage to even declare. You are afraid of what people will think or say, so you keep that seed buried. You're pregnant. And the Lord said we are in the birthing season. Mm -hmm. This is a season now that we must give birth. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because when you give birth to that seed, what I see, Bishop, is I see new ministries. I see revived ministries. I see mission program, mission work. I, I hear songs that have not been sung 
yet. Poems that have not been put on paper. You're carrying it. And you need a spiritual midwife to help you to give birth to what God has put in you. Because when it comes forth, it will advance the gospel and it will make God's kingdom a reality. In Jesus' name. Spiritual midwives. That's what we need. And I pray that you will join me in that prayer, church. Because my desire, my hope, my prayer is that we will all experience the power of God when we are able to give birth to what he has put in us. Glory be to God. Amen. Let us pray. And so, dear God, as always, we pray over every revelation and every prophetic utterance that, dear God, that it will come forth and it will be established by the power of the Holy Spirit and it will do and perform all that you declared it and sent it to do, O oh God. Because none of your word go back to you void. So we declare it in this place and we thank you for manifestation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now we can get on with uh, the few words I have to share with you today. And we speak to leaders who have just been installed. Uh, and our theme again is divine provision. Because as a leader, I want you to leave this place knowing that to every vision that God has given to a leader, he makes a provision. Amen. I got one amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. To every vision, no matter how big, in fact, what I found out, Bishop, is that when God gives you a vision, it's usually bigger than who you are, bigger than what you have, and it demands more than who you can, what you can get. Amen? Amen. That's how you know it's God's giving you that vision, because now, to perform it, you need his provision. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. So, to the leaders installed today, and to all of us in the church today, I want us to leave this place with that understanding that God has already made a, a provision. Now when you hear the word provision, let's get this out of the way. I don't want you just thinking about what you want. Because most of the time when we hear that, we're trying to tune into what we want God to do. Hallelujah. But when we speak of provision today, divine provision, we're talking about what you need. Hallelujah. We talk about what God provides, how God provides according to your need, not your wants. So we get your wants out of the way. And what I've been teaching and, and, and preaching and, and urging uh, Christians or anybody who will listen to me, that we need to now take this approach. We need to read, we need to listen, we need to study the Word of God with what I call a kingdom mindset. As believers, we are expected to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus said, everything that what Jesus engaged in was with the kingdom of God in mind. God, Jesus was driven by this. He was motivated by this. That's why when you listen to him through the gospel and his sayings and his teaching, even the, 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 the parables and, and the miracles that he wrought were all with the kingdom in mind. Having a kingdom mindset is it, not just a way of thinking. It, it is a way of living. Where the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God becomes now the priority, not a priority, but the priority of your life. The Bible is true when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. And then all of these things that we so desire will be added. They're not given, they're added. Because if they're given, you could lose it. But they're added to you so they become a part of you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, when we talk in kingdom, the devil doesn't like that. The devil doesn't like that. He will do everything he can to keep us from talking kingdom or keep us from having a kingdom mindset. And so many times, that's why we struggle. Because instead of working God's kingdom agenda, we come to the table with all our own personal agendas. And then we turn the church work into politics. Are you hearing me, somebody? Yes. Jesus, Jesus says that there was a time now, let, let me get this right. In the book of Genesis, the Bible teaches that the first thing that man gave, God gave man, before man had any chance to work or to please God or to do anything, to earn anything from God, God said, let us give him, that is man, dominion. Amen? I'm in the Bible, right? Let us give man dominion. That dominion, if we go back to the Greek and the original language, when we get a proper translation, it is now kingdom authority. Hallelujah. And that's what God has given to believers. But in Genesis, we lost dominion. It was not stolen from us. It was not taken from us. We give it away legally to the enemy. Hear me somebody. And so when God came on the scene, he asked the woman and the man, what have you done? Do you realize what you've done? Now, because God declared in Genesis 3 that now Satan or the serpent he said, the seed of the woman. Come on. It will be the seed of the woman that will come now to crush your head and you will bruise his heel. What does that mean? That means, believers, that something that was legally lost had to be taken back legally also. And so, fast forward, the seed, Jesus came forth. Jesus was tempted by Satan in three different stations. At the final station, Jesus uh, said to Satan, in, in other words, Satan, I will not use my divine power to take back this dominion that you took in the garden. Because now, for God to take back this dominion, Legally, it had to be done in the flesh. Follow me now. Follow me. It was lost by flesh and blood. It had to be regained by flesh and blood. And so God had to come in the form of a man, but he came as the seed of a woman because he didn't want the tarnished blood, the contaminated blood of Adam to have anything to do with the seed that will come now by virgin birth to take back the meaning. Amen. Amen. Flesh and blood lost it. Flesh and blood regained it yes. in Christ Jesus. And now Christ Jesus gives it back to you and I. And he said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me and I now give you authority. Believe us, I say this because now as we pray, as we carry on the work of God, don't be that person who go begging God. Yes, don't be that person who go okay, okay, it's not a bad thing, but that's not your position as a believer, as a child of God. You go now, you stand in the presence of God and you declare by the authority in the name of Jesus. You speak to that devil. You speak to that situation. You use that authority. And that's why the devil does not want you to hear 
the word of the kingdom. And Jesus said in Matthew 13 and 19, he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and now some of us hear word, Bishop, and the little bit of word that we hear, because we are so distracted, and we have not, not much interest in the word of God, so we don't really process it, and we have a hard time understanding it. I'm very careful to say understanding because there are a lot of people who know the word of God, but they don't understand it. And I tell my church, knowledge is good, but understanding what you know is even deeper. A lot of people know stuff, but they don't understand. And when you lack understanding, you can't appreciate what you know. whatever word you have received quickly before it take root in your heart. Hallelujah. Amen. But in the face of all of that, we must carry out God's kingdom mandate and declare the word of the kingdom and teach the principles of God's kingdom. We must be witnesses always, whether on the job, in the home, in the community, not just on Sunday. But we must be witnesses always. And we witness by the way we live. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't, don't, I, I don't want to lose your church. Stay with me, please. I need you for this last stretch. Because when we talk about divine provision, I've come to understand that it is the bedrock of biblical stewardship. And it focuses on God as the sole provider. You're like Abraham crying out and saying, God, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. If you don't give it to me, I won't get it. I look left, I look right, I look behind, and God, I don't see any help but you. The sole provider. Whenever you are Thinking this way, the sole provider, divine provision is a kingdom principle of divine provision. It, it is invariably linked to his divine purpose and his divine will. For wherever the purpose of God is being fulfilled, God makes a provision. Whenever you are about God's business, when you're carrying out God's mission, God's provision will find you. Yes. Amen. Amen. The theology of divine provision is directly opposite of the world view. This world we live in today. Because I, I put it to you this way, there are many, even church folks, who are relentlessly pursuing wealth according to the world. We are pursuing what this world offers, but in the context of a value system that excludes God and deny his divine provision. The pursuit of material things yeah. driven by the greed it's a problem that confronts the heart of every human, even those of us in the church. There's a French philosopher who puts it this way. He says, it's strange to see folks working, doing overtime, amen, to make extra money so that they can 
buy stuff to impress people who don't even care about them. Did you hear me, folks? Oh my God. And and so it reminds us now that we are looking for the wrong things sometimes. And sometimes we have the wrong motives. But mostly what I found is that we're looking in all the wrong places for our provision. Some of you are maintaining friendship and relationship because you believe that that is the source of your provision. Some of you are in situations that you are not even meant to be in. You are afraid to leave that situation because you feel if I do, my provision will come to an end. You need to see God as the source. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This word reminds us that God is aware of our needs. Our need for security, our need for peace, our need for protection, and all that pertains to this life. But we must get our priorities straight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. With a kingdom mindset, we can appreciate God's kingdom agenda that guides us in all that he does. With a kingdom mindset, his kingdom now is our priority. He wants you and I to reintroduce in our thought process and our understanding an unshakable confidence that the Lord is God. That's what he's trying to get through to us. I am God. I am your God. I am the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Yes, God is our provider. We know him as Jehovah Jireh. Always has been, always will be. I said to the leaders today in God's church, you must understand now your calling, the anointing as you serve. Don't lose sight of this truth that where he gives the vision, he will make the provision for that vision to be fulfilled. Yes. Yes. I'm already talking too much, but let me just work on one verse of scripture. Uh, yes, <laughs> I just want to work on one scripture. Uh, Genesis 3, 21. And then we'll be done. Genesis 3, 21. The Lord God made clothes from animal skin for the man and his wife and dressed them. Hallelujah. Amen. There are three truths that we want to draw from this one verse of scripture before we sit down. A simple word but yet so profound. And I believe some of you have eyes and understanding, you already see what I'm talking about in Genesis 3.21. God. God made clothes for them out of animal skin for the man and his wife and dressed them. In the context of what's happening, Adam and Eve are in the garden. Adam had listened to his wife, and I'm not blaming Eve, because no, Bishop, I can't believe it. That sister argued with sister six verses. Back and forth. She turned to him and just said, eat, and he didn't argue. Amen. Amen. I can't blame her too much because he should have been the one to correct her, but he went right along. And that would have bought God said, the thing that you did wrong, Adam, you listened to your wife. I believe that a little bit. <laughs> She's not that much. You gotta love me today. God said, You listen to your wife. I ain't telling nobody. Don't be for here. See the pastor say, I'm gonna listen to my wife. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but it's in that context now that we find God has appeared. And God asks, Where are they? Not as if God was looking for their geographical location. God knows all things at all times, completely. But when God asks us a question, it is provoke our thinking 
And God wants them to realize that something has changed. Do you realize that there's been a shift in your positioning? Hallelujah. And, 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 and do you realize the implication of that change in your position? Because of what has changed, you can no longer remain in the garden. Hallelujah. Amen. And so there got an eviction notice from paradise. Imagine man was living in paradise where all of his needs were met. He had everything he could ever need, yet he yielded to temptation and Listen to this one here. <laughs> and got an eviction notice. So he got the eviction notice. And now they put on some fig leaves as they were leaving. God Almighty, the first truth that I found in this verse, that El Elyon the creator of God performs the first I mean this is the first time we have innocent blood being shed for the guilty. Amen. If you're reading that verse now with a kingdom mindset, it points you to Calvary. Ooh. Hallelujah. Amen. It takes you to that place now where Jesus our Lord and Savior, our blessed Lord and Savior, shed his blood. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I may live. He shed his blood. And that was the indication here in verse 21 that the innocent suffered for the guilty. Glory be to God. Amen. The blood was shed because in order to get the skin, something or someone must die. Got the skin. And then the second truth is that God Almighty becomes the first designer and tailor. <laughs> hey! Whenever you saw, you're acting like God. You're creating. You're designing. That was God's first, that the first job to show what God doing. Amen. What a blessed profession. We find God himself taking measurements. Hallelujah. Selecting the style and the cuts and now putting it all together. And he was not just sewing for women, he was sewing for men also. The Bible says he made a garment for Adam and his wife. That's an indication of God protection. Because now when he clothed you in that new garment, I like how Isaiah called it the garment of righteousness. Hallelujah. He puts you, put because that's what you're going to need to make it through this evil world. God's going to put a new garment on you. Yeah. One that he made. One that was not made by man. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. The third truth that I see in this verse is that now God not, not some angel not some apostle not some preacher but God himself dressed him. Now, mothers, mothers, you can appreciate this whole part. When, when you dress that child, mm. hallelujah, yes. it is because you went to the store. You bought what they were wearing. You brought it home. You decided when they were wearing. And you took your time to dress them. Yes. Yes. It shows his love. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And it points us to the book of Revelation that tells us now that when he comes back, he's going to put a new robe on us. He's going to dress you in a new robe. So what do we see? We see salvation. 
We see redemption. And we see glorification. All right here. When I read the passage, I came to realize they put on the fig leaves, right? I, I don't call it fig leaves anymore. I call it fig leaves. And as they're leaving, it's as if God said, stop! Come back here! Because those fig leaves that you put together won't last. Today we don't have fig leaves anymore. But the concept is still real. How often haven't we found some way, somehow, something to cover our shame? Yes. Shame that comes as a result of our sinful living. Yes. Come on. Come on. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Yes. I know I'm speaking the truth. I'm talking to some real yes. folks today. Yes. Oh. We will use religion, we will come to church, yes. we will read the Bible, mm. we will sing in the choir, we will serve in the church, we will do all of these things with the hope that we will impress God enough. <laughs> Failing to realize you can't impress God. Amen. The Bible says that even on your best day, all right. your garments are like filthy rags in the sight of God. Amen. Try all you want. Mm. You cannot hide from God. Amen. Adam and his wife were trying to hide their shame. They covered themselves with fig leaves. Bishop, I said we, we wear fig leaves even today because we're trying to cover our mess Especially on Sunday. Man, on Sunday, you see how people dress. I must say, the other day I walked into one of uh, this lady visited my church and I went to her store. And when I walked in, my wife and I walked in and uh, talked to the lady. And, and then my wife said, But you were at the church the other day. You don't remember us? She took a double look. She said, Oh, Pastor, are you? I said, Yeah, that me. She said, You're in regular clothes today. I said, Yeah, that ain't my Sunday best. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Sometimes when we dress on Sunday, you see on Monday, he will not recognize us. And, and sometimes women won't get up talking about my sister a little bit more. Because when you leave from church, they buy and put it on. When you take it off, and you put on different one, when we see how we get it. I'm going to let them my church. Then you got to do it after. I don't be sure. I was sporties. Bishop, when they put it on something, when they talk about it, it's red, it's brown, it's blue, any color you can do when they can make it. So, when you see some of our chest system and you pop out in your store, they say, oh, you saw me earlier, you used to be at the bar, so I'm not sorry. I said, but be careful, make sure. When you go to heaven, you're going to go to work out to you. Hallelujah! When the angel check you out again, don't get this. Glory be to God. It reminds me of when I was growing up. And I would get ready to go out. And I thought I was a big boy at the time. But I would get to the door. And I would hear my mother say, come here, boy. And I would come back to her. She said, what are you wearing? Let me check your pants. Lift your pants. Let me see your socks. Sh show me your shoes. Let me make sure they're clean. You ain't going to go out there to make me look bad. And I said, but mommy, how come how can my dressing, my dressing don't have nothing to do with you, see that? No. When you go out there looking worse, they will not say, oh, the boy, not looking good. They say, ain't that Jesus, son? You ain't going to make me shit. 
In the same manner God has said to someone here today. That thing you're wearing, that thing you're wearing to cover your shame, I can't let you wear it no more. Come back, let me exchange your fig leaves for a garment that I have prepared just for you. Amen. You are installed today, you put in office, no matter what your title, we all, this, we all have the same assignment. Yes. That is to be Christ's ambassadors. Yes. And the Lord has made a special divine provision for that. You are now clothed with a new garment. You are a new person according to 2 Corinthians 5. You are a new person. Don't, don't even look back. God has taken care of of your past. He has forgiven you. Hallelujah. Don't, don't let the devil remind you you are forgiven. The blood of Jesus is not shed in vain. He has clothed you with a new garment of righteousness. You are wearing Christ now. The most important thing as an officer of the church is to realize that your life is no longer yours. You can no longer indulge in any and everything because you want to. Your life is a testimony. You may not even realize it, but people's eyes will be on you. You or somebody else will be standing there doing the same thing. They will come, they will not look at that person. They will look at you because they're anointed on your life. And the question would be asked, aren't you the director of music? Aren't you in the choir? Why? Because there's an expectation now, you're going to be judged on a different level. Everything you do or say or engage in becomes what I call kingdom matter. And what matters to the kingdom matters to the king. Your life must reflect that yours is a ministry now of what Paul called reconciliation. You have been equipped by God who has made a provision for everything you will need to do, to serve, to make disciples for Jesus Christ. We'll say this as we close. And Bishop, may I get down here for a minute? My eyes not good. I want to see who I'm talking to. I got to come closer. You're here today. And as we speak of divine provision, what the Lord has placed on my heart, I came to talk to the leaders, but this is for all of us. You have a need right now. And that need has not come to shame you. I know you wish you didn't have to be in that situation. I know you wish you didn't have to have that need. Because there was a time that if that need had come up, you were able to just address it right away without even thinking about it. But today, it has come and is sticking on you like a plastic, something you can't seem to deal with. It didn't come to shame you. I speak prophetically to you today that that need had come for a purpose. It, it come to reveal God in that situation. And that's why our prayer can no longer be God, why me? Why now? No, no, no. Our prayer should change. Lord, reveal yourself to me in this situation. Because I know it has come to show me who you are. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. I don't know if you're sick today, but that sickness is an opportunity to experience the power of God's healing. Amen. You're broke. 
you, you broke because you are now, because of that situation, able to experience divine provision. Amen. And the truth about divine provision, God is now waiting for the situation to arise before he goes searching through what he will need to give you to meet that demand. To so every problem, the solution has already been established. But we have to access it now by faith. Are you able to believe God for your supply? Are you able to see God as your provider? I'm not just talking about saying it. I'm talking about believing it and walking in it. I say this story and I sit down because I'm talking too much, but there's this guy, Bishop. He went and he bought a, a ticket to get on an ocean liner to take a trip. And this trip was going to last for 30 days. One month. On the sea. And this man now, being very careful, decided to pack his lunch, his breakfast, his snack, and dinner for 30 days. Got on the boat, they set sail, and something happened. The, the route they were supposed to take, the storm was too much, so they had to reroute the vessel. It added a few more days to the trip. And so by the time they got to a certain point, my man ran out of provision. So now he found himself hungry, desperate for food, and he started sneaking around, picking up leftovers. At one point, he's so hungry. And I don't know if any of you ever experienced hunger like that way. Even when you hear plate knocking, spoon knocking, plate, you, you, yes. <laughs> yeah. he's dead. Yeah. You're salivating. He was looking through the window into the restaurant cart, and he saw all these people laughing, eating, drinking, you know, making merry, and he saw all the food they were leaving over on their plate. I think some of you were there because you don't eat all the food that are on your plate this time. <laughs> some of y'all were in that dining car, yeah. wasting food. And he's like, the only desire on this man's heart, if I could just get some of that leftover. He didn't even want a mean thing. Let me just have some of the leftover. While he's there, spying through the door, one of the officers on the vessel came and saw him and caught him and said, Hey, you, what are you doing there? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm doing nothing, I'm not stealing anything. And he said, wait a minute, are you a stowaway or did you come on board legally? And he went on explaining his story to the man and said, okay. The officer said, let me see your ticket. He pulled out his ticket, gives it to the officer. Officer examines the ticket, looks at the man, look at the ticket, looks at the man. Every time he look at the man, his face gets more, you know, the surprise. He said, sir, now he's not calling you man anymore, he's not calling him sir. He says, sir, do you realize the ticket you have? He said, well, I bought it legally, I didn't steal. He said, no, 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 no. I ask you, do you realize what this ticket allows you to do? He said, you have a first class ticket. Mm, wow. With this ticket, you can go to any one of the many restaurants on this vessel. In fact, you can go to the captain's room and eat with the captain. In fact, if you don't like what they're serving, you can tell the chef what you want to eat. You can have meals, not just when they open the restaurant, when it's closed, you can cause them to open it. Yeah. I need <laughs> This guy started to cry. <laughs> so you won't tell me. I've been on this ship. <laughs> Super than I did. And I got that kind of ticket. He said, sir, yeah. He said, but sir, we got to take this more love on the vessel, on the trip. I think you should start taking advantage of your ticket. And sure enough, 
Ma me il? Che cuore vuole fare il Il meno for all the time that you know. I say your story to us because you are that man. And sometimes I'm that man. God has given you a first class city. But here we are. Depending on our own ability. Depending on our own resources. That when they run out, instead of exercising the authority that this ticket God gives us, we start to hang around and act so pitiful. Believers, I want to leave this truth for you today. When Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, when Jesus went into that grave for three days and rose on the third day, it was so that your ticket can be established, punched, and signed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Don't let Satan lie to you. You are the vessel called life. You can eat anywhere. You can have what you want. You can declare it. You can call it. It's all yours because of what Jesus did. Amen. And therefore, we can say to you today, that is what we call divine provision. God bless you.